Uh, it's been quite a couple of days. I mean, who would have thought that um, questions of public transit and mobility could uh -huh. generate this kind of energy at, at Mackinac? Um, a couple of things struck me as really remarkable. One is uh, I think I've rarely seen someone as professionally balanced, respectful, and almost heroic as Warren Evans. Mm -hmm. Warren. Mm -hmm. Now, regardless of what side of this question one lands on, the, the idea that uh, leadership can take such a graceful, thoughtful, um, constructive form, I think is just a huge reassurance. I mean, a little bit along the lines of what the governor just said, it's this kind of leadership that essentially defines the region. And I'm just, I'm, I'm proud to have watched um, the county executive lead us through that with the enormous help of Khalil. Uh, who has been extraordinary, so thank you. <laughs> Second, I never th uh, thought I would see the day, and again, I don't mean this in a way that has tried to tip the, the balance on the question, but I don't think I've e I thought I would ever see the day when we had 220 corporations agree on anything in this region, and to have them <laughs> uh, come together around the question of of the need for uh, greater thoughtfulness about our mobility strategies in Southeast Michigan was really quite something. And uh, DTE and Jerry Anderson deserve a lot of credit for that. But there are a lot of people pulling in that direction, and it was quite extraordinary. So, um, but because there has been no controversy on this question, um, <laughs> I wanted to do just a, a couple of quick level sets before we turn it over <laughs> to the panel. Um, it seems to me that there are four or five arguments swirling around that make it sort of hard to get a bead on this question. I mean, you've heard a lot of very high rhetoric and appropriately on all sides of the question about the need for transit in particular forms. But it struck me that we've got at least five um, arguments that, that probably we need to dispense with before we go too far. One is the sort of the, the don't confuse me argument. This is the idea that you can't really have a smart system and you can't really have an RTA system because all of the complexities make it uh, too confusing to people. Um, I'm here to tell you that that's wrong, that that is essentially something that can be reconciled and will be reconciled in whatever we ultimately come up with. Uh, the second one is the sort of the we can only do one thing argument. And I've heard a lot of that, that you know it's either roads or mobility or something else. And in fact, this region is capable of doing multiple things at once. Uh, so I think we should just sort of dispense with that one. Um, the third one was, um, is the Amazon didn't really mean it argument, that um, the transit really wasn't important to their, uh, to their decision. Newsflash, it was. And uh, whether, again, no matter how you choose to solve for the question, this was tremendously important to the decision, not only of Amazon, but to other folks who are thinking about locating in the region. Um, the fourth one is the we didn't really mean it argument, which uh, stems from what that County Executive Evans uh, talked about earlier this afternoon, the idea that we spent almost a year trying to stitch together an agreement among the four principals, the mayor and the three county executives, uh, with enormous heavy lifting from the staff. An agreement was reached uh, that seemed to acknowledge the issues of all sides. So people, I guess that's actually an example of the argument actually uh, being correct. They really didn't mean it. But why they didn't mean it is sort of hard to know. But we actually had come to a, a view on this question. That's neither here nor there. We're not now of a single mind, and we need to move forward. But I think it's important to raise up simply to acknowledge that we can come to an agreement on these questions, and of, if people of good faith and goodwill can do that. And finally, and my, my kind of favorite one, is the let's wait for the flying cars argument. This is an interesting question <laughs> that you shouldn't try to get regional transit down until the technology is perfect. Um, I, I think that there are all sorts of ways in which that sort of is a red herring. That there, uh, I, don't need, I probably don't need to belabor that too much. But the point is, is that they, we have to design a system that is sufficiently flexible to both acknowledge the current state of technology and the future state of technology. And I think, again, this is the kind of thing that's a sort of susceptible of, of being done by reasonable pe people. And so with that, I think let me turn it over to the panel, because the ultimate argument that I think is being um, made is that our community really doesn't need integrated, 
comprehensive regional transit. And we have three people here who I think are going to uh, begin chipping away at that argument uh, fairly powerfully. But I thought we actually would use the panels to bring this conversation to ground. What does this really look like uh, from an employer's perspective, from a public official's perspective, um, and, and try to understand what are the implications of proceeding uh, in one way or another. And we have three sort of extraordinary people to lead us through this. And so maybe we'll just sort of go down the line, if that's OK, sure. uh, and start with uh, the mayor. And mayor, you want to just talk about Sure. First, you Rep, I want to. I want to. You know, this morning, John Boehner had Bloody Marys, and we've got water. So, you know, I just <laughs> setting the tone here for us. No, th thanks for having us. I guess uh, on the need issue, and and uh, you know, to me, you talked about the Amazon lesson with the headquarters and so forth. But my background was business before I got involved mm -hmm. in, in local government. So I spent 30 years running a company in the city of Livonia, uh, and was a Romulus guy, and was involved in city council. Then became mayor in 2013. So so a couple, couple explanations. On the business side, when you're talking to businesses, there's a great need. As we grow in the region, you know, people want us to be able to help them get employees to their sites, not just Amazon, but others. So uh, from local government standpoint, when we're competing with other regions around the whole country, we've got to look at that. In my business background, I would go to Chicago, and we'd fly into O'Hare, and I'd take the L downtown, and I was able to get back and forth. And if you compare our region to other areas that are prospering, uh, you know, not just use Chicago's example, but in other areas that Amazons of the world and other companies are going to, uh, because of those reasons, we're deficient, we're behind. So isn't it our responsibility to look at those options to come up with solutions, to come up with solutions so that we are an attractive market, more attractive than you know, competing with other uh, major metropolitan areas around the country. So I think it's a huge need from that standpoint. From your perspective of as a mayor, though, as you, as you look at the commuting patterns, the sort of the live-work patterns of your community, how, how does this make a difference, or is it just irrelevant? Well, I think it does make a difference, a couple from both business and the residents. So I do business visits because of my business background. You know, Tim Keyes, who's here, he and I go out every week, week or two weeks, and we talk to businesses. We say, what keeps you up at night, business? And we have several businesses in Romulus that have said, you know what, finding talent and getting talent to their location uh, is a challenge. So for us to be the conduit to help come up with a solution to do that, I think that's huge. For the residents, they want employment opportunities. They want to be able to go to downtown Detroit or to Ann Arbor or wherever it may be to increase their own individual opportunities as a resident. Great. So Andy, there, uh, for those of you who haven't seen Andy's really scary binder, um, <laughs> next 45 minutes we're going to be walking through this binder. Uh, explain to us what you got there. Sure. Well, uh, you know, as the treasurer, I like to follow the money. Uh, it's a good, you know, general rule. And so, you know, this, this conversation has gotten so hot, I just wanted to get to some data. Uh, and so I started uh, examining the budgets of communities in Oakland County uh, and to try to separate a little bit the rhetoric uh, from the fact. And you know what I found when I started looking at the budgets is that virtually every community in Oakland County is investing right now in mobility. I also find that when we call it mobility, it's a little bit less charged than transit. You know, I wonder if that term hasn't become too politicized. Yeah. But what I found was communities, and by the way, some opt-out communities that are investing right now in getting their people around. Uh, Waterford is one of the communities, and if I may, I want to uh, acknowledge the county commissioner from Waterford, uh, Tom Berman, uh, who is seated with uh, Dave Woodward, another county commissioner, um, bipartisan support for RTA, uh, which I really think we should all applaud, frankly. <laughs> You know, Waterford, um, Waterford had a township board meeting on the 14th, and people came out of the woodwork because they found out that the funding for their senior call and ride program is no longer available. And there are 600 seniors that are going to be stranded who rely on the, those services to, uh, to get around. Um, and, you know, Novi, uh, and uh, uh, here we if go. I got to go to page 13. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, Novi has been right in the epicenter of this whole dialogue. And, you know, I, I got their budget. This is the 2018-2019 uh, municipal budget for the city of Novi. 
And incidentally, it was passed unanimously. The uh, mayor voted for it, everyone else did. And you know, when I look at that favorite page 13, in the short-term goals, one, expand senior transit and establish free transportation within the city of Novi. And two, work with 12 Oaks, West Oaks, Novi Town Center, and 12 Mile Crossing at Fountain Walk to establish a circulator trolley uh, for customers and to get people to work. And it, it struck me, this doesn't sound like a community that doesn't want transit and mobility services. This struck me as a community that needs a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so we're doing it right now, but we're doing it in a manner that is inadequate and also that is not as cost effective as it could be. And one of the premises that we've been exploring is, mm -hmm. you know, all these local communities, uh, even in North Oakland County, um, you know, they're spending this money. There's a, a, an economy of scale that can be achieved, you know, through the RTA. And if we're buying all these services uh, in bulk and lowering the unit cost, mm -hmm. that can produce more mobility services in a region that needs it desperately. And I would just close with, uh, I talked to my friend Kurt Metzger, uh, who's the famed uh, demographer. You know, and Kurt pointed out, there are 234,000 people who live in Oakland County and go to work in another county. Hmm. 213,000 in Macomb. And so, you know, our workplace, kind of like the mayor was talking about, these workplaces are all around the region. And so we need to have a regional mobility system that can facilitate that and get people where they need, where they need to go. But how about the argument, though, that you just sort of stitch it together? So Novi does its, Waterford does its, and at the edges, they kind of fudge a little bit, but ultimately you get what you need. I just don't think it works. You know, I don't think it works. We've tried this go it alone approach uh, with, I think, the failed experiment of the opt out in SMART. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if we want to get clever about opening up that statute, there are some things that we could do that would be a lot more productive. Uh, you know, for instance, um, you know, perhaps we could have a uh, mobility tax credit. Uh, where if somebody lives in a jurisdiction that is paying a millage on mobility or transit, perhaps that could be a credit on their state income tax. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a way to get the state more engaged and would also address you know, some of the concerns. I'm treasurer, I'm fiscally conservative, and so uh, you know, I appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, how precious each, pe each penny is for our hardworking citizens. Uh, but you know, that's a little food for thought. Mm -hmm. okay. Barbara, uh, yesterday I was struck that uh, Bob Riney at the, uh, at the big CEO's press conference talked a little bit about the, um, the sort of the day-to-day -day sort of hardship mm -hmm. that the uncertainty of transit provides, that if you, if you have a standing appointment and you miss that appointment, you're fed into the emergency room system, the emergency room system then kicks in all these protocols, and by the, by the time you're done, you end up just incurring enormous cost. But from a health system perspective, it's not just that, right? I mean, it's, it's your employees, it's your talent. It, you're sort of a microcosm of, mm -hmm. of all of these conversations, I assume. Right, I think we are. And first, I'd like to say thank you so much for the opportunity to join our panel today. And the great thing about going last is that many of the points were covered yeah. <laughs> there. So when we, when we speak to, I think, the point that the mayor made that's really important is um, about the attractiveness to the global market and being able to be attractive to uh, talent coming in and showing the seamlessness there. It's interesting because yesterday at one of the Mackinac moments, um, John Recalta mm -hmm. made a comment about uh, the US News and World Report that indicated Michigan's uh, 36th ranking relative to education and infrastructure. And while he spoke about uh, the educational component, you know, the infrastructure component was there too, which gets exactly at the heart of what we're talking about here. And then Andy's uh, point about the interconnectedness, while systems exist across southeastern Michigan, the, the lack of interconnectedness really doesn't work. And I think your point about the ability to opt in or opt out doesn't work really, because I think it gets us to where we really are today. To get to your uh, point, Rip, though, that I, I think is really important, and to build off of what Bob shared yesterday, is that the lack of the integrated services and the seamlessness that exists across our counties, we did a study within Henry Ford Health System in 2016 for about six months, and just in that six-month period, greater than 19,000 patients missed their appointments, the majority of which 
were related to transportation issues. Mm -hmm. And if we think about that, to go further with the point I think Bob was making also, is that as our patients miss their preventative appointments or those that are follow-ups from a hospital stay or something like that, they become more urgent and emergent, then that causes them to need to go to an emergency department, a hospitalization, much more costly care. And we know no one's concerned about lowering the cost of health care. Um, so it does create drama, not only for the patient themselves, but also for their families. I uh, queried some of our uh, team for stories, and one of the stories that they shared with me, I thought that was quite poignant, gets to the point of not only missing appointments, but also the embarrassment often that patients feel when they miss an appointment and they feel like they've inconvenienced us as healthcare providers and it's not at, uh, at it all. I mean, they are whole people and we understand that their body, mind and spirit with all of this. But the story was an established patient who was sick and needed his physician. He had a friend that was supposed to bring him to his appointment. The friend didn't show up. He rode three buses to get to his appointment and arrived over an hour late. He was worried about being late, worried that we were going to be frustrated and he would have lost his appointment, of course. We got him in uh, to give him what he needed. This was an individual also, and we have many of these people who do rely on transit that didn't have a cell phone, had minimal funds. You know, We needed to support him getting back to his home. But these are the kinds of issues that we have when we talk about lack of connectedness among our transit systems and the relevance that it really has to the whole individual. And I think as we think about transit too, it's just, if we think about health and wellness more broadly and think about all the treasures that we have across southeastern Michigan, um, body, mind, and spirit is not just health care. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, it's the arts, it's the nature trails, it's the orchards, it's all of these kinds of things that we all have among our communities and are so important to be able to share back and forth. And, Transit does help facilitate that. I think we have infrastructures that we can build on with our existing systems, and I think the ability to collaborate and bring together those infrastructures to create something that can truly be magnificent and have for us, have transit be among our greatest strengths rather than the one of the areas that's called out in the news and world, news, uh, US News and World Report would be just remarkable. As, as a goal for us. So Andy, I, um, I, I think I recall reading someone who represents your county talking about the fact that Oakland County is doing just fine, thank you very much. How do you deal with that argument that, that you've got this sort of prosperous community, uh, whether the, the transit needs are being met in all directions is maybe neither here nor there, that it, Essentially, you've, you've been part of a county that has sort of soared over the last 20, 30 years. What, I mean, what's the answer to that? You know, I, I think the answer to that is that I think anyone that's looking at it objectively sees that there is a regional realignment that is happening. Hmm. Um, and, you know, perhaps that is a re-realignment um, in that, you know, folks went out to the suburbs and now there's, uh, you know, a consolidation that's happening. Uh, during these last 30 years, it's been a time when the city of Detroit's been very challenged. Um, and so what I would say to that is that we have to be real about what's happening. Uh, you know, you, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. Uh, you have to innovate. Uh, you have to figure out how you can be additive in this regional economy. And I'm just so sure that this fighting for scraps and playing small ball is, is just, uh, it's looking in the rearview mirror. And uh, you know, we need to look ahead. The, you know, Governor Snyder just asked us to look 30, 40, 50 years into the future. And on this issue, we just can't get our eyes off of that rear view mirror. Um, you know, we gotta right size that. And you know, these communities are just showing in so many different ways that not only do they invest in, in transit, as I, I show here with these budgets, but they, they value it. And they want this to happen. You know, in Rochester Hills, we have this thing called the Older Persons Commission, uh, or the OPC. And, uh, you know, the OPC right now spends $720,000 a year on transportation, mm -hmm. getting seniors around, um, you know, getting people to the doctor, uh, you know, to Barber's Point. And, uh, you know, right now they offer call-in ride. Uh, you have to call in advance. 
Um, they are open from 8.30 in the morning until 4 p.m., uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 4 on Saturday, and then 9 to noon for church on uh, Sunday. Uh, and they're very limited in the geographic range that they can go. Um, and so, you know, what I think we have to do is kind of clear away all the emotion to this conversation mm. and just talk about what it is, which is getting people where they need to go mm. and getting people where they want to go. And the RTA offers for the Older Persons Commission uh, the opportunity to expand its capacity. And just one other quick example, you know, people talk about North Oakland County and north of M59. Well, there's something called the North Oakland Transit Authority. And what do you think that is? Hmm. People in North Oakland County determined that they needed to get around. They determined that there was a benefit in pooling resources. And so six communities in North Oakland County, uh, three townships and three villages formed NOTA. NOTA spends $1.2 million a year on transit, but they don't want transit. It sounds like a community and a, a, you know, an area that really does need it. It's just they don't want this caricature that's been created in the media um, by my colleague in Oakland County. Uh, you know, but when you wash, wash that away and just talk about what it really is, they're like, oh, yeah, that's something that we need desperately. Mm -hmm. So, Mayor, talk about the airport. I, you know, it, I think if county executive is still here, early on that was clearly a priority in sort of driving this plan, that we needed to sort of create something comprehensive, that there was actually a pretty powerful sure. argument for taking a first step along the sort of the east-west route between Detroit and the airport. Sure. Yeah, I think the airport is key. The way I view the airport is this, and my story is um, my family was displaced with the fourth parallel runway. Mm -hmm. So I could be one of these people saying, you know, the airport, <laughs> the airport's the greatest economic engine in our region. So shame on us if we don't recognize that and leverage that relationship, um, not just for Romulus, but for all the whole region. And so the way I view the regional transit for the airport is just mainly way people think of, okay, passengers, I'm thinking of employees. When we talk to the businesses at the airport, we have people riding bicycles to work at the airport. Do you realize that? So connectivity from between Ann Arbor and Detroit to the airport, not just from passenger, but for employment is huge opportunity. So it opens up a ton of avenues. Uh, you know, I think the, app, the uh, airport as a resource and kind of, you think about it, who's flown into the airport? A lot of people here. I mean, it's one of the nicest airports in the country. So shame on us if we don't allow it to be accessible for both other employees and passenger use for this region. Do you, uh, one of the things that the, the Q line has done mm -hmm. in Detroit, of course, is not just ferry people up and down, but actually create nodes of development all along the, the route. Is that something that you imagine is just unique to Detroit, or is that something that could happen in your part of the world? No, and I think part of the discussion with regional transit should be, what's the best options now? How do we grow those options for the future, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's going to be the future generations that are going to use that. And in the other arguments I hear about the infrastructure and people kind of picking, as you said in your points, about which one they're going to get behind, and I hear that from some other local leaders, is that, you know, we're, we're elected, okay? I'm elected as a mayor. I have other mayors here, Mayor Nolan here from Ingster. Our job is to come up with solutions, right? So they put us in these positions to, with all these local issues, infrastructure, uh, transportation, uh, growing the economy. Guess what? We need to also worry about fixing education. And while we're doing it, look out for the environment, right? So we can't just pick those options. I think when I view this as far as regional transportation and Romulus and the airport and the whole region, I think we're crazy not to continue to work on solutions. So when I hear that mindset, it's a little bit scary because we're going into an election cycle here in November. So whatever office some of these folks are running for, I mean, we need people with solutions. We need people that are going to reach across the aisle, reach across the bordering communities and say, let's help come up with solves for the problem. Um, there's no, you know, I heard about the rear window or rear view mirror mentality. Mm -hmm. We can't have that. It doesn't work. We've got to look ahead. So let's build on the uniques and what the value we have. The airport's one of them. But this region has a lot of other uniques. Why not connect them? Let me flip that on you just a moment, and any, any of you can answer. But um, So if you're the elected official for, let's say, a county, hypothetically, um, isn't it your call whether to move forward with this policy argument? I mean, why should that be left up to the voters? 
I believe it should be left up. I think the voters need to have a say. I mean, we represent our people, and I, and I, th I think that the, the county elected should be standing forward and looking forward and not looking in the rearview mirror and finding a way to connect and, and not just look at your boundaries as a, as a county. Just the same example I said as a city. I've, I've worked hard with the surrounding communities around Romulus and Western Wayne County so we can work together on solves. If we just look at our border, I think we're selling ourselves short. We're just looking ahead. We're not looking at years out in ways that we can enhance all our services the way that we should. So I would answer your question uh, that you know I would encourage all leaders, county leaders and others, uh, to work with our neighbors, find ways that we can work together, not point the finger, not tell us why not, but try to come up with solutions that help the whole area. You know, I, I, I might just add to that, that um, you know, with regard to an elected official's opinion, uh, Everybody's got one. <laughs> and I guess, you know, what I would hope is that instead of relying too much on the opinion of one elected official, that we, we'd look at empirical evidence and that we would benchmark ourselves against other regions, other states, other countries to find out what really are the best practices. And there is an answer as to whether or not a regional transit system is, uh, you know, produces benefits. Uh, you just look at the top markets around the country. Uh, some of those communities that were on the top 20 HQ2 list. And um, you just, you can't deny it. Uh, Cleveland, uh, you know, last year, I think I was here listening on the, the stage, I think there was a woman from the Cleveland Regional Transit okay. Authority. Mm -hmm. You know, she talked about how along the uh, health line where they did bus rapid transit, they've experienced a 325% growth in property value, and they've had 5.9 billion in investment along that route. Mm -hmm. So objectively, empirically, transit drives development. And uh, we just, we can't afford to be out of step with what is working in other markets. Uh, it's, it's held us back. Um, I just, it scares me to think about how far behind we are and that we're, uh, you know, we're getting lapped. We have to act now. Mm -hmm. We have to get a piece in place. Um, this RTA proposal, still a little bit of a, you know, um, there's still a process for input. Um, but I think that when I look at it and read it and talk to locals, I see a real value proposition for every community across the region. And uh, we, we got to get it done. We got to get this piece in place so that we can move on to the next challenge. You know, Barbara, you know, I, oh, yeah, please. No. I could make a comment. You know, I, I believe that our county leaders are put in those positions to represent their constituency. And I, I do think. Um, that they do hear them. I, I, I think, you know, this is a, we're talking about a change, a regional change that we've not had in southeastern Michigan before, so it's different. And I think we have the opportunity to work with the people in our communities and in our county to bring about many of the comments that you made, Andy, and Leroy made, but I think also is to help them understand, understand ensure we understand better what where the gaps are, what the needs are, mm -hmm. and get them invested in it as much as we believe it's the right thing, because then we'll get the votes that we need to make this successful. I truly believe that everybody believes we need to get there. It's just let's get people brought along in the right way so they're behind the need and then excited about it. And I, you know, um, in our, in our county, the experience I've had with uh, um, people that I've talked with in preparing for this, I think the understanding is not as deep as it needs to be. Mm. And that provides opportunity for us. Mm. But you know, we all know, we're all business leaders and business people. We know how to uh, lead toward change, lead through change. And I think that's the opportunity that we have. I really do. Well, and that was going to be the question I asked. I mean. Uh, uh, a month or so ago, we had a fairly remarkable event in which the four hospital systems of the region jointly signed a, mm -hmm. a piece in the free press right. urging this. So how, how does a hospital system with the sort of the combined weight of the four of you um, help do exactly what you've just described? I mean, is, it, is it something where you sort of wait to, to provide input? Do you uh, advocate? Do you... Uh, meet in private chambers, what do you do? I mean, how do you, I mean, that's a powerful, powerful presence in our region. You get th those four hospital systems mm -hmm. on the same page. That could be quite extraordinary. What, yeah. what are you gonna, how, no, how are I you gonna help us? I appreciate the question. I think, 
you know, the position was discussed. We took it back to our organizations to get input and buy-in, brought that forward. And it can be done. It doesn't have to be a lengthy period of time, but it needs to be thoughtful. Because, you know, in our organizations, we know who our formal and informal leaders are. We know the ones that can get out and give feedback back to us quickly. We all have mechanisms to do that. And it works really, it works really beautifully. I think we know the same thing in our counties. We know who our leaders are. We know who our informal leaders are. We know how to get input and facilitate that. I think Andy had a couple of great um, concepts that he talked about, about some of the areas that had opted out. They didn't opt out about the notion of transit because they knew they needed it. They opted out for what the solution was that was on the table at the time because it, I'm, I'm making a judgment about this. They probably didn't understand that it could have brought something like death to them. And maybe at the time it couldn't have, but it's a great place to come off of to begin building. And I don't think it would take long to do that. I really don't. <laughs> so. I mean, you're talking months, right? You can do this in months? Yeah, that's good. Um, I didn't say months. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I assume not. Um, we have blue cards on your tables. And what we were hoping to do is sort of move pretty quickly into some conversation and comments. So. Have you, have you filtered these? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> the mayor will take them. <laughs> Thanks. Andy has the answers in his book. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so let me, I, I won't even tr try to understand. Do citizens who live in and vote in opt-out communities even realize they are in an opt-out community? Maybe they don't want to opt out. Hmm, that's interesting. What would you say to that, Andy? Well, I think uh, you know the good people of Waterford, you know, are certainly getting a wake-up call right now uh, about that, and and that's why everyone rushed to that, you know, to that meeting uh, to express their concern. Um, I don't know that there's 100% uh, recognition about whether somebody's opt-in or opt-out. It's a very technical term. I think the people on a more fundamental level just know uh, that they need to go to places. You know, that they've got these places that they need to go and that they want to go. And I think a lot of them, if given the choice, would take advantage of an alternative option. Mm -hmm. And it will take time to kind of get people in the mindset of mm -hmm. using different modalities. Um, but you know, there's a lot of different ways that folks get around right now. Yeah. A lot of these communities are investing in uh, sidewalks, uh, trails, bike paths. And so what I think we can do is help them build a multimodal mm -hmm. transportation infrastructure that meets their local needs um, and ideally, we can get rid of this opt-out, uh, which is really a failed experiment. Well, and we, I think we mentioned earlier that the plan that is in development is different from what was put in front of the voters in 2016, and it's tried to address a lot of the, the concerns that were raised the first time around. Do, do Maybe I'll turn it back to you, Andy. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Do you have the sense that there is a sufficient flexibility in the sort of the renewed plan to, to do exactly what you've just described? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I really commend the authors for learning the lessons of, of 2016. Um, but the, the hometown funding, uh, I'm blanking on, it's hometown services, um, is a piece that is meant to address that concern from 2016 about flexibility. The 2016 plan invested a lot of capital in building the three uh, bus rapid transit routes along Michigan, Gratiot, and Woodward. Yep. Um, and so taking that investment out of it cre created uh, more money for local communities in those hometown areas and in the core service areas to develop their own local uh, programming. Um, and so uh, while at the same time filling the gaps, adding the number of routes, and then getting us to that 15 minute increment which is really what you need to have for a real reliable transit system, you know, somebody can't really wait more than 15 minutes. Um, some of these stories that you hear, um, I mean, if, if, if anyone hasn't seen uh, Executive Evans' video uh, where he, you know, took the bus um, and demonstrated, you know, some of the limitations, what this new plan does is it really beefs that up. And the bus route piece is locked down and then if in the future uh, we want to expand, we want to talk about some other piece, uh, then we could do so. Okay. Mayor, uh, let me see if 
you can handle this one. Um, it says that with the state law requiring that 85% of the revenue raised in a county has to stay in that county, how can we calm the fears of communities that they'll lose out to their neighbors? I think you spoke in general terms about that yeah, earlier. I think in general terms, I think it does protect them to give them a feel or sense that it's going to you know, take care of their own area as well. I think maybe the fear is that it's, you know, money's going to go off into another area, another county, and they're not going to receive that benefit. I think it does protect them. So I think uh, to the point of the structure, I think it's structured so that it should give them confidence. So. Great, great. Um, what are the specific steps required to get a transit initiative on the November ballot? Is it still possible? Paul, I may turn to you in a moment if I've still got Paul Hilligan somewhere. You do, yeah. Um, but, but essentially, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, we've got um, a requirement that uh, of the, on the RTA, all four counties essentially have to have at least one person voting in favor of putting it on the ballot, and it has to be a super majority. So it has to be seven of nine with one vote from each county. And so theoretically, um, you actually could bring this up in May, June, or July and still get it on the ballot. Is that correct, Paul? Yes, we have until mid-August to get it on the ballot. Um, but the representatives on our board are appointed by the county executives, and, and what that supermajority requirement means that virtually every county and the city have veto power. Um, so um, we will have to convince Oakland and Macomb before mid-August um, that this is worthy of uh, uh, having voters um, make a choice. Well, but I'm encouraged by Barbara. She believes we have time to do this. So you've got two months to do this. <laughs> I think you're interpreting the months. Yeah, I, I am interpreting. Um, let me be, be less flippant on that. Uh, I think, I think uh, the county executive this afternoon made the powerful point that uh, we really want to push uh, he would like to push hard over these next couple of months to see what would be possible, but that we'll run a parallel track, uh, that, that there are, are options that may not look like the plan we've got in front of us. There are options that, that might project it forward into 2020 where we might do something a little bit different. So uh, it's not over till it's over, but I think our sense is that uh, you are right, that there is, there is time both in the next couple of months, but then uh, over the life of a community. We've, uh, this is not something that's going to go away. And Paul made a very powerful appeal this afternoon not to let this issue die, not to walk away from any decision in the short term um, with the belief that we can't get this done, because we, I think, think we can. I think the key really, uh, and one of the keys also is really satisfaction that we're truly building on infrastructure and strength that exists across all of our yep. counties to create the system that will truly be sustainable and be able to be built on uh, as we go forward. This is a, interesting, I think a really interesting question. How do we close the gap between the business case for mass transit that we've just been discussing and individual community members' uh, distance based on increased costs? Many citizens want good roads, not mass transit. That's that. Uh, the sort of the dichotomy I talked about earlier. Any, any response to that? Well, I, I said a little bit earlier, I think you have to do both. I don't think it's one or the other. Uh, I think the mass transit will, in, will make some improvements to infrastructure, but we have a problem statewide with infrastructure. Local communities have challenges with the funding mechanism that's there, so we've got to fix, them, fix all those issues. I don't think we can pick one or the other. We need both. I think uh, regional transit does give us the opportunity to make some infrastructure improvements. Uh, I talk with a lot of our other mayors and supervisors that are in either you know, Conference of Western Wayne or Down River, and uh, you know, I listen to them and I hear what they say and their residents are telling them that same thing. Uh, but I think the, the infrastructure and roads and bridges, uh, we have to work on that. We do. We're behind. And I think we need Lansing's help to do that. Uh, we need to work together as communities to do that, community leaders and find solves to do it. But what's happening now is I think because it, you don't invest, it's the analogy just like a house, you know, right? Mm -hmm. You're not fixing and doing repairs. Now we're in a situation where we have infrastructure problems in local neighborhoods, uh, county roads, state roads. So uh, it's a huge problem. But I think we've got to fix them both. I would agree with the mayor. I think, you know, if um, we're successful with the uh, RTA and we um, have great lanes for RTA but have really not such great lanes for 
uh, routine traffic, it's just going to create sure. much more animosity. So going at this together, I think, would be very powerful. Yeah. You know, we, uh, I talked about the state, and you know, the mayor just mentioned that. You know, one other way for the state to get more engaged in this would be, you know, Governor Snyder came forward with this proposal uh, to uh, refine the revenue sharing formula where local communities that adopted certain practices would get an incentive. Uh, I think it was EVIP, which I never remember the acronym. Um, but by the same token, you know, we, could do, we could do the same thing for uh, local communities that are investing in transportation or mobility infrastructure, uh, including potentially autonomous infrastructure. Um, that would be another way to get the state more in the game, hmm. because it's not really a regional issue. You know, it's it's every community across the state of Michigan right. that is facing this challenge, and so if we could engage the state a bit more, uh, and my goodness, how many hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds hmm. have we left on the table over the last 20 or 30 years? Um, I'm confident with our uh, legislators in Washington that. Um, you know, maybe if we had the right plan that they could uh, take advantage of some of those dollars that we have just not had our act together enough to, to seize the moment on. Uh, this, uh, this question, I think, is sort of a variation on the sort of scarce resource question of asking uh, how do we make sure or how, how can we be assured that the RTA millage is not going to be a threat to the smart millage? And for those don't know, the smart millage comes up in August, and I think there is sort of a sense that if there's too much noise around the RTA, it sort of undermines the, the case for smart. You, you don't buy that? Please. Well, I can, I mean, that's something we're actually very concerned about because uh, really one of the key elements of RTA also is the smart mm -hmm. part of it, um, connectedness in terms of what exists currently and what could exist. So. We've got to ensure that that continues to go forward. I think one of the challenges that we have with SMART is that it comes up every couple of years, and we have to con you know, continue to put it back on the ballot. And so the RTA brings us a longer, a longer opportunity for something that we would be working toward that would give us consistent and growing sustainability. But we, it, it's from our perspective, and I'm certainly not going to speak for Andy, but. Uh, for our community, especially for what we have right now, for healthcare specifically <laughs> in our community, if something happened with SMART, the connector service is what really gets many of our patients to and from, and especially the elderly, to appointments, to hospitals, all of our hospitals in the county. It would be detrimental, a huge detriment to the RTA as it's proposed and as we continue to improve it and our existing systems if we did not get that passed. I can tell you from a raw missile standpoint with the smart system, we need smart as well. I mean, that's a key part of it. So yes, having two options out there, is it a threat? I mean, I hope it isn't because we need both. And, and I, I can tell you that smart, even with the new Amazon location, it's a fulfillment center that's coming to Ramos, they're increasing some of those smart routes because we're part of that system. So I can't say, okay, we want to do away with that. I mean, we need that for employees that are coming to that fulfillment center. So uh, I think it's, it's important to have both. You know, I, I think I might, you know, respectfully disagree a, a little bit about that. And I, I frankly think that some of the potential confusion comes from people saying confusing things about it. <laughs> um, you know, that's a natural consequence. And I really think that there is a bit of a turf issue here, for lack of a better term. And, you know, SMART does a great job with what they've got. Um, but SMART is not a complete regional system. Uh, and so uh, we need to um, get these entities working in partnership. I feel for SMART that they're on the four-year millage cycle. Um, and so it's, it's hard for them to build more uh, when their funding is so uncertain. Um, in contrast with the Huron-Clinton Metro Parks, uh, which the millage is in perpetuity. Uh, imagine the difference operationally that an organization is going to have um, when it's got that flexibility. Um, and so I just think we have to be really careful about this smart or RTA uh, discussion uh, and that we need to craft them together as, as partners. Um, and you know, perhaps there's some opportunity for uh, more partnership. Uh, but I think a lot of people are very happy you know, with their, their smart services. Mm -hmm. 
um, but I think they would also be happier uh, with more service, uh, which can be provided by the RTA. Um, and, and that's for now. Um, for the future, you know, we have a silver tsunami coming. In, uh, by 2040, uh, the regional uh, senior population is going to go from 25 to 40 uh, percent. And so, you know, we're going to have uh, places to go. We're going to have places to get mom and dad. Um, and so uh, we got to get out in front of this now. And uh, I just I hope that we can make the most of this opportunity while we have it. So, you know, I I just like to clarify though. I don't if if I, what I said was interpreted that way. I I think you know what we're talking about is exactly what you said. Is how do we build on the strength of what we have right. mm -hmm. to create a much stronger system through what RTA would bring us. But I I do believe that we need what Smart offers currently to be able to build upon it to get to the greater end. Without it, we would lose what infrastructure that we have currently. And I think that brings us something to build on. I mean, I'm curious, though, about uh, maybe a couple of these questions sort of mushed together. I mean, this is a difficult issue to build political will around. I, I came from Minneapolis, and, and we essentially had exactly this conversation. I can't tell you. It was just exactly the same. Huh. And the mayor, uh, the mayor was on one side, and the governor was on the other side. And, and what we realized was that it was very difficult to animate citizens around this question. They were kind of content with what they had. They couldn't quite see the future. They didn't want to pay for something. Um, and the sort of the notion of seamlessness didn't affect many of them. Um, how do you, I mean, Paul made the point uh, earlier this afternoon that uh, it would be nice if we could inform our legislative candidates uh, for this fall because uh, around these issues. But this is a hard one when you know when you rank crime and neighborhood livability and job growth and, and everything else, this tends not to rise to the top. Uh, how, how might it? What would you do, Mayor? How, could you run a campaign on transit? Well, I, I think it's like any other campaign. I think the, the big portion is finding the passion of the voter and what's important to them, right? I mean, the value proposition. You know, as he mentioned. Yeah. So I, I think that's what you've got to play on. There are a lot of decisions to be made. Um, local leaders, county leaders, state leaders, they all have decisions to make. Uh, getting that message to them, and, and when you run a campaign, you have to have a consistent message. Data, right, Annie? I mean, that's got to be part of it. So sharing the facts, but tying into that passion statement and that value proposition for them. Is it easy? No. Uh, I think when you have multiple levels of office uh, running, I think all those players should have the same information mm -hmm. by far. Uh, so then the, at least the voters can ask them their position. And if they're educated and aware of the topic, uh, you're going to have a much better chance of lessening that gap. Is that doable? I, you know, I'm positive. I think anything's doable. Is it easy? No. Uh, but anything is, is possible. I think, you know, we're, we're working on something right now with a, a public safety, uh, a fire and police millage. Is it going to be easy? No. Uh, but, you know, is it doable? Yes. And, and, and my job and my team's job is to share the facts. And that's why I believe they put us in office. That's why I think local, county, and state officials should be compelled and passionate to share the facts, uh, bring a book like Andy has and sit down and say, <laughs> look, this is the topic. You know, it's pretty easy. Make some decisions here. And, and I think that makes it more doable. Rip. And if you were the political director, Andy, what would you, what would you advise the folks who are advocating for transit over the next while. I wrote a piece in the Yoakum Press uh, some weeks ago, and it started with the question, what's in it for me? Hmm. And you know, the reason I started it that way is to say that not everybody is going to appreciate the benefits of having a regional system. Um, you know, this kind of emotional benefit of just knowing that, hey, we put this piece in place. Uh, but they are going to be in touch with what's in it for them. And so if, it, if for them, if it's up North Oakland County and it means that grandma's going to be able to uh, go to the doctor or go shopping after 4 p.m. Um, and to have a, a lot more livability, to be able to stay uh, living at home longer, um, or to have uh, you know, the benefit of a cohesive regional system, um, we've got to be able to answer the question, what's in it for me? And I've really been kind of hounding about saying, we've got to do that for every community across the region. We don't want to leave anything uh, un, you know, um, not understood. 
and I would just, you know, hit that message. And like you said, I mean, if people f perceive that there's value in it, they're going to make the investment. Mm. When I tell the citizens of Oakland County that we're going to get at least a, a dollar six for every dollar that we invest, you know, as the chief investment officer for Oakland County, you know, I can say that that's a good investment. You know, that's something that's going to generate a good ROI. From a, if I could, uh, from Please. a healthcare perspective, we do know what the problem is because we have the data on mm. missed appointments. We have the data on missed appointments as it relates to increasing chronicity or acuity going mm. to emergency rooms. So we are able to get to that what in it for me for that population, and that wouldn't be unique to Henry Ford. I mean, any of our health systems would have access to that. So I think we have multiple ways that we could get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, working together collaboratively, uh, agreeing, that, uh, agreeing to commit that we need regional transit, and let's make it our greatest strength, you know, instead of where it's sitting right now. <laughs> We're a little bit at, at, at time's end. Um, uh, uh, it's always hard to sort of walk away from these conversations knowing what we should do, right? I mean, you have a lot of folks uh, probably on all sides of this issue, but um, is, it, uh, is it up to the folks in this room to go out and put pressure on their local uh, uh, House or Senate candidate? Is it to um, write letters to their county executive? Is it, wh what would you guys just very quickly have people do? Well, I can speak, you know, I, I represent a community. I, I do believe electeds listen to their residents. They listen to their businesses. They listen to residents when they hear their voice. So I, I think you need, to, you need to express those opinions. And, and I do believe that people will um, listen and, 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 you know, if, the, if it's valuable information, they'll you know, process that and, and they'll lead them to the right conclusion. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing you could do is advocate for, you know, what you believe in. And look, our system is the best in the world, right? You know, we're, we're great at knocking it and picking it apart. Mm -hmm. We have the best system in the world. So let's let the system work. Let's hear those folks mm -hmm. and let's take what they say and let's offer up solutions for them. Okay. Andy? Just say, you know, there's a saying that you know, where, there's, where there's no vision, the people will peril. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that you know, what we have a tremendous opportunity right now is to conceive of a shared vision. And I am profoundly uh, optimistic, not only about the future of Oakland County, but about the future of our region and our ability to rise to this challenge. And I'm confident that through people reaching out and contacting their elected officials, business leaders engaging, doing everything that we can to keep this issue at the forefront of our conversation, mm -hmm. um, that that's when we're gonna finally get across that tipping point and where we'll be able to just finally cross this thing off our list and then get to the next thing that we have to overcome as a region. But I'm confident mm -hmm. uh, that when we do that together, mm -hmm. uh, there is no challenge that we cannot overcome. I don't know that I have much more to add, except you know we are the leaders. It's our accountability um, to get this to an end that's going to be satisfactory all the way around. And I think knowing, understanding better where the gaps are, where the points of disconnect are, and getting them to connect collaboratively is going to get us where we need to be. We must be there. That's great. And I think I think I would just say that um, when I think back on 2016, when the first proposition was put on the ballot. I don't think we had this kind of energy. I, I think it just, uh, there were a lot of good ideas. I think the RTA did a nice job of getting its ideas out into the community, but I sh certainly didn't feel this kind of passion. I think we're seeing it from grassroots folks. I think we're clearly seeing it on the island. And I, I'm hoping that regardless of what happens, Paul, in August, um, that we kind of keep it up. And I, I know from our perspective, we're gonna be looking for ways to keep people engaged um, keep, keep this sort of in front of people, make sure it doesn't go away, because I think you're right, Andy. I think, um, you know, as the, as, the, as the region goes, um, it becomes such a much more exciting, vibrant place to, mm -hmm. to be with issues like transit and livability and other things at the forefront. Mm -hmm. So could we all thank our panelists for taking the time? Well done.